If you have your Bibles, let's turn over to Psalms chapter 78. And I'd like to give a little bit of introduction before I get into sharing the Word. Typically when I minister, I just get up and I don't know exactly how to explain this, but God tells me at the time what to minister. And that's the way I've ministered. I don't ever prepare a message. I just get up and share what God has been doing, and it's worked for 40 years. So that's the way that I normally minister. But there are a few times that God speaks something special to me, and God spoke something very special to me about these meetings. And I'm going to be sharing. He showed me this months ago because primarily a lot of it was he was dealing with me personally about some of these things. And I just felt that this is what God wanted me to share. So I'm going to be sharing a teaching that I, I did back in 2002 entitled Don't Limit God or Taking the Limits Off of God. And the reason I did that, I need to give you a little bit of background. Uh, I've had a number of times that God has supernaturally touched my life. But one of them, if you've listened to anything I've ever taught, you've heard about March the 23rd, 1968. All of my Bible college students, that's part of their uh, requirements. They've got to know that date before they can graduate. But boy, God just transformed my life. I've never been the same. And uh, that started everything going. And I've been in ministry in, since 1968. But then on January the 31st of 2002, uh, it was a culmination of about 40 days worth of things that had been happening. We were having to move from a facility. We had outgrown about 14,600 square feet. And we were looking for a new facility. And Jamie uh, was working with a realtor while I was gone ministering. And they looked at a building that was 30,000 square feet. And Jamie, I remember Jamie saying, oh, this ought to last us forever. And when she said that, it was like, oh, no, my vision is much bigger than that. But I realized, you know, Jamie and I share everything. And I hadn't told Jamie my full vision of what I felt like God had told me to do. And there's lots of reasons for it. But the bottom line is that you get afraid of people rejecting your vision. And, you know, back when I first started, people stayed away from my meetings by the thousands. It was just... <laughs> Amazing. I mean, I ministered in Sigaville, Texas for two years, and the largest crowd we ever had was 15 people. And most of the time, it was four or five people. And so, you know, it just didn't seem to be appropriate to be saying that someday you'd be on television and traveling the world and reaching people. And so I, I quit speaking it. It's like if you bend over and pet a dog, and every time you do it, it bites you, you quit petting it. And so I had quit speaking my vision, and I, that came to pass. Anyway, I'm not going to go back through all that, but there was about four or five things that happened that just showed me that I was complacent where I was. And, and some of you might get the wrong idea and think we weren't doing things. We had doubled in the size of the ministry from January of 2000 until January 2002. So it's not like we weren't reaching people and touching people and doing things, but... I had uh, become complacent, and I just wasn't pressing, and I wasn't believing God for bigger things. And the Lord started speaking to me in a number of different ways about how I was limiting God by my attitude. And uh, it all culminated January the 31st of 2002, and it's a long story, but the Lord just opened up my eyes. And these are the verses that God used to speak to me. And what I'm going to do is just go through and show you some of the things that God has done to change my life. And since then, everything has just exploded in the ministry. We are seeing people's lives changed. It was, in my estimation, the second most important encounter with the Lord I ever had and the thing that I've found out as I travel and minister is that basically this is the same thing that every one of us goes through. I'm going to talk about a lot of different things that limit what God can do through you. And if this helps you half as much as it's helped me, I guarantee you this could transform your life. I believe that we could see tremendous things happen out of this. Every one of you have an area of influence that God has given you. And most of us aren't doing enough with it. We serve a big God. I mean a supernatural, miraculous God. And most of us, our experience is natural. It's not supernatural. I often say that if your life isn't supernatural, it's superficial. 
You ought to be able to look at your life and say, if it wasn't for God, this could have never happened. This could have never happened. If you can explain your life away and say, I've done all of this. I've worked for this. This is all my doing. Then you haven't tapped into God's plan for your life. God has a supernatural plan. And we have a supernatural God living on the inside of us. And most of us are limiting Him tremendously. And my testimony is that when the Lord showed these things to me, and I'm going to be sharing some things with you that are really good. Those of you that have heard the series that I did back in 2002, this is going to be an updated version, and I'm going to share a lot on imagination and how to get a vision and how to fulfill that vision that wasn't in that original teaching. So this won't be exactly the same. But it is my testimony. When the Lord spoke to me, this was January the 31st, 2002, about midnight, God just broke through, and I mean changed my life. And uh, on February the 11th, I called my staff together. We had 30 people or so at that time. I called my staff together and I said, look, and I told them what God had done in my life. And I said, I don't know how long it takes to change this image on the inside. I don't know how long it takes to change the way I've been. But I said, I'm going to change. I said, I don't know if it takes a, a week, a month, a year. It doesn't matter what it takes, but I'm going to be different. And I told them that February the 11th, within two weeks, my whole life had transformed. I was just shocked at how quickly things began to change. And things changed before I had time to start telling other people. It, it changed in ways that it proved to me that this wasn't something that I made happen. Like, for instance, in our finances, if you're thinking, you know, about all of this. It was uh, September the 11th was in 2001, and this was only about four months, five months or something after that. All of the ministries that I'm aware of in the United States went way down, some of them in crisis mode, and many of them actually came close to collapsing. Did you know that our income started going up? And in January of 2002, when the Lord showed me this, it took me about uh, probably a month before I got around to writing a letter and then a month to put that out. So it was two months before my partners heard about this. But within one week of me making that decision and telling people, our income nearly doubled. Everything just changed before I had time to tell anybody. There was no way it could have been something that I did. And it proved to me beyond any shadow of a doubt that it's just, you know, there's a lot of scriptures. I'm going to be talking about some of these. But Proverbs 23, 7 says, As he thinks in his heart, so is he. The way that you are thinking right now is what's causing your life to go the direction that it's going. And many people think, oh, no, you don't understand. I've had this happen to me, and I haven't had this happen. And we are living in a bad economy now, and it's this, and it's this. And we're pointing to everything else. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, and I'm going to try and get this point across as forcefully as I can, that it is not what's happening out there that's affecting you. It's right between your ears is the problem. Amen. It's the way you think in your heart. As you think in your heart, that's the way that you are. And somebody says, oh, that's not so. Yes, it is so. And somebody says, but I'm sick. And I didn't think and want to be sick. No, but your thinking was sick. You may not have sat down and thought, I want to have cancer. But you know what? You were thinking that I'm only human. I can't control this. Everybody else, it's flu season. Everybody else is sick, so I guess I'll get sick. That's sick thinking. And if you don't cooperate with the devil in your thoughts, Satan cannot do all of the things to us. The Lord flows through the way we think. And if you are limiting God with your thinking, then you are going to stop what God wants to do in your life. The scripture says, as you think in your heart, that's the way that you are. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, acceptable and perfect will of God. The way that God's will comes to pass in your life is through the way you think. And I'm going to challenge you with everything I've got this weekend to begin to start thinking bigger and seeing bigger and it's my personal testimony that when I did this, long before there was anything in the natural that could have occasioned it, I saw supernatural results. 
And the Lord's been speaking to me the last month and a half or two that, you know what, it's time for me to stretch my thinking again. And he's been telling me to think bigger. And we just found out a week or two ago about some of these things with TBN. And you know what, I already, in just a, I, it's probably been maybe 40 days maximum that the Lord's been speaking these things to me. We are seeing breakthroughs. And it, it could be next week. I mean, they, they said after the first of the year, they'd let us know. It could be this coming week that we see something that was 15 years off in the future, not too long ago, coming to pass next week. And you know what? I'm telling you, it happens not because of external things. It happens as you think in your heart determines how your life goes. If you want change, you're going to have to change the way you think and the way you see on the inside. And that's what all of this is about this weekend. So I was reading these verses. There was a lot of things. This is just a portion of it. But here in Psalms chapter 78 is where the Lord was rehearsing what had happened with the nation of Israel and basically rebuking them because He had been so good to them. He brought them out of the land of Egypt. He was faithful. He did all of these miraculous things for them and yet they just constantly turned away from it and forget, forgot what He had done. And he's rehearsing all of this. And I'm going to break right into the middle of this. But it says in uh, Psalms chapter 78 and verse 39 that he was merciful unto them. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And God just used that 41st verse like a dagger in my heart to say, you're limiting what I can do. You limit me by my small thinking, by my fears, by my laziness, complacency, by just getting occupied with the things of this world and not seeking after Him. God told me that I was limiting what He could do. And you know, before I start getting into all of the things that we do to limit God, let me just make this point. And this has to be stressed because this, in my opinion, is the worst doctrine in the body of Christ today. And it is probably the most pervasive doctrine in the body of Christ. And this, this idea that God sovereignly controls everything or that fate just controls things in case sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Did you know that that doctrine will kill... Everything I'm going to be talking about this week, and I promise you, it will render you powerless and you'll be like a pinball going through life. <laughs> Amen. Just, you know, like you pull back and you launch that pinball and it just boing, boing. It just depends on what happens, what you run into, and your life is just controlled. This person did this to you, so you're always going to be upset. You're going to be hurt. You were abused when you were a child. You're this color. You don't have this education. Your family did this to you or whatever. And people go through their entire life being controlled by what somebody else does. I'm just saying in the name of the Lord that what other people do, do does to you... How do you say it? What other people do to you has no control over you unless you give it to them. <laughs> Nobody can make you bitter unless you choose to be bitter. You've got a choice to become bitter or better. And the, our society today, nearly outside of the Christian realm, embraces this attitude 100% that you are a product of your environment. They don't give you any responsibility over your life. And they tell you that the reason you're this way is because you were abused when you were a child. Because you didn't have a birthday cake when you were three years old. And that justifies you being a triple, triple rapist and a murderer. I actually saw that on television one time, that a guy went back because he was denied a birthday party that justified him raping and murdering. Some of you think that's silly, but that, that's what people are doing today. And people are saying, it's because this person did this to me and this. And they aren't taking responsibility for their life. I'm telling you that you have a choice whether you become bitter or better. Nothing has made you the way you are. Now, some of you may have had problems and opportunities that other people haven't had. And I admit that that happens. But you can go to families where you have siblings that have the same gene pool. They were raised in the same environment. 
The parents were alcoholics. One of them will become an alcoholic and blame it on their upbringing, and the other one will become a total teetotaler and go the other direction. There is nothing in the natural that makes you be a certain way. Yes, we all have temptations. Yes, we all have problems. But you know what? You do not have to participate. You know what? There may be a recession going on. There may be problems, but I've just chosen not to participate. Amen? I don't have to be a part of that. You do not have to be governed by other people. You do not have to let circumstances govern you. This thing about that fate, you know, it's just a matter of circumstance and you can't control it. And so you're just floating downstream on your inner tube and just hoping that you don't hit anything that punctures it. And you're just singing kumbaya as you float down the river. That attitude will kill what God wants to do in your life. You've got to come to this realization that God created you. You did not evolve. You are, there's a difference between you and a dog or a cat. You were created in the image of God. You've got the Spirit of God breathed on the inside of you. And God has given you the right to choose. And you can choose to be different than you are. If you don't like the way you are, change. Well, I can't change. This is who I am. Just pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. Take responsibility for yourself and begin to recognize that you are made in the image of God. And if you would find out what God's will for your life is and cooperate, you can be what God wants you to be. God doesn't just sovereignly control everything that goes on. And let me say this, brothers and sisters, that I believe that the church is responsible for a large degree to the way that the secular world approaches things. We can sit there and say, well, yeah, nobody takes responsibility. They say alcoholism is in their genes. It's not a choice. Being obese, overweight isn't anything to do with your choices. I had two people tonight that asked me to pray for them that they would be skinny. And, I, you know, I told them in love, but I said, hey, that's not how you get skinny. <laughs> You eat less than your body needs and do that over a long period of time. That's how you lose weight. You can't just pray and get delivered. You have to take personal responsibility. The world as a whole is dodging that. They're, they're trying to ascribe everything to it's not my fault. Somebody else has made me this way. Or we're wanting a pill that's going to fix it. And you can sit there and criticize the unbelievers if you want. But you know where a lot of this comes from? Is the church. Because the church has preached the sovereignty of God and that nothing happens but what God allows it. Case in point. Example. September the 11th. Every major leader in the body of Christ that I heard on television got up and said, this is God judging America. That God is doing this. When the, when the hurricanes hit, this is God's judgment on New Orleans. For the homosexuality and stuff like that. Man, if God was judging America, there is coming a time of judgment. But right now we're living in a day of mercy and grace. God's not the one doing this. If God was releasing His judgment, He wouldn't have stopped with New Orleans. <laughs> Amen. I can guarantee you, Houston's not any better than New Orleans or Dallas-Fort Worth or Phoenix or any place else. When God starts judging, He's not going to do a token judgment. That's not the judgment of God. But see, people were up there saying, well, it couldn't have happened what, but what God allowed it. That is not true. You know, you don't. I could prove this from a dozen different scriptures real easily, but you don't need to go any further than this. Here's the Lord speaking to the Israelites. And He said unto them, I wanted to do this. Look how good I was to you, and yet you provoked me, and it says in verse 41, Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Did you know that the, the normal doctrine, the pervasive doctrine in the body of Christ today is that God does whatever He wants to. Nobody can limit God. God is almighty. God is sovereign. You know, I'll agree that God is sovereign if you want to use sovereign the way that the dictionary defines it. The dictionary says sovereign is uh, first in rank, order, or authority. It'd be like we're saying that he's at the top of the food chain. If you want to say that about God, I agree 100%.
God is almighty. He is first in command. But to say that God chooses everything and controls everything, and if your life is a mess, God willed it, that's wrong. And the church has been preaching this, and this, this verse, among many others, proves it. He says they limited the Holy One of Israel, which that terminology is referred to Jesus many times in the New Testament. This says you can limit God. You stop God. It always amazes me to go to these funerals and people get up and say, well, we don't know why God took this person. They just automatically make an assumption that when you die, it's because your number's up. And you can't die, but what? It's God's will. That's not so. That is absolutely untrue. The scripture said, the Lord told us in the first place, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because of the day that you eat, you shall die. He didn't want us to die. He told us not to do it. And when we ate, we're the ones that ushered in death. And it says in Hebrews chapter 2, I believe it's around verse 14, that Jesus came to destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Satan kills people. Satan comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God doesn't control every person when they die. God doesn't control if babies are born, deformed, and things like that. You know, when I was a kid, they had this drug that they gave pregnant women. What was it for? I forgot. Thalidomide. Thalidomide. I forgot what that was for, but it was for morning sickness, if I'm not mistaken. And they gave this drug. And the women who took it had babies that were born in their arms, never got longer than like six inches. I remember playing baseball and I was a pitcher pitching to a guy that only had two little tiny arms that could just barely grab the bat. And there was kids by the thousands, tens of thousands born that way. And people think, why did God do this? And I'm sure the Christians were saying, oh, God has a purpose. God didn't do that. You took a pill that destroyed and did damage to the baby in the womb. God doesn't control those kind of things. God isn't the author of evil. God is a good God. He's not a bad God. In the Old Testament, there are examples of the wrath of God, but praise God, the Bible makes it very clear that under the new covenant, we've been redeemed from the curse and that Jesus is not the one who's putting problems on you. It says in James, if any man, you know, is tempted, he's not tempted of God because God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. We are drawn away of our own lust and enticed. God is not the author of evil. God is not doing these things, and yet the church is saying this. So the very first thing I have to do is to let you know that God can be limited. God doesn't sovereignly rule your life like a chess piece and just determine what's happening. You cannot blame God on the failures in your life. God has a perfect plan for every single person's life. And if you aren't seeing that plan fulfilled, if your life isn't exciting, it's not God's fault. You know, I mentioned earlier that we've been with my family for two weeks and I've had a great time and I've enjoyed being with my family, but man, I was so excited to get back to doing what I'm called to do. What a blessing that I love doing what God called me to do. If you do something that you have to force yourself to do it, if you don't enjoy doing what God's called you to do, then it's because you hadn't found out what God's called you to do. You ought to be excited about it. If your life isn't supernatural, it's superficial. If your life isn't going good, it's not because God doesn't have a plan for you. It's because you aren't cooperating. You haven't found out that plan. But I'm telling you that God doesn't just sovereignly control your life and make it work out. You have to pursue the things of God in order to receive it. You know, I had a person one time tell me, I've prayed and God has an answer. I've sought and it didn't work. You know, keep your finger here. I'll probably come back to Psalms chapter 78. But over in Jeremiah chapter 29, this has become a popular verse. Lots of people know this. But in Psalms, I mean, uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, in verse 11, he says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And if you were to take this and put it in its context, it makes it even more powerful. Because in the context, it's talking about the judgment of God. Because these people had broken the covenant, because they had become idolaters, and they were just 
doing everything contrary to what God said. And this was a different covenant than what we have today. God's wrath was being vented and He had told them in this chapter, I'm going to send the enemy in. They are going to conquer your cities, burn your cities, take your women that are pregnant and rip them up. Total death, destruction. And in the midst of Him pronouncing this judgment on them, He says, but... I know the thoughts that I think toward you. This isn't my plan. This isn't my, what my will for you is. My will for you is peace. To give you an expected end. The Lord, in the midst of pronouncing judgment over these people, is lamenting the fact that He couldn't do what He wants to do because they wouldn't cooperate with Him. And then He says in the next verse, Then shall ye call upon Me, and you shall go and pray unto Me, and I will... Uh, hearken unto you, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. This doesn't say that you just seek and find. It says you seek and you will find me when you search with all of your heart. There's a lot of people that say, all right, God, you know, if you can reveal yourself to me in the next five minutes before my favorite movie comes on, you got five minutes. Perform. It's not like that. It's not like that. You have to seek with all of your heart. Or another way of saying it is that as long as you can live without knowing what God's will for your life is, then you will. But you know what? When you reach a place to where, God, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I'm going to find out what your will for my life is. And you go to seeking with all of your heart. There is not a person ever in the history of the world that is sought with all of their heart that God hasn't answered. It says over in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, I believe it's either 2 or 1st or 2 Chronicles, it says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the entire earth, seeking to show Himself strong in behalf of those who are perfect in His sight. Perfect in His sight doesn't mean that you're sinless or that you don't have any problems. It's talking about people who are seeking Him with all of their heart. And the eyes of the Lord are running all over the earth looking for that. God is here tonight. God is in this room. The Spirit of the Lord is in this room searching every single heart and saying, is there anybody who really is seeking with all of their heart to let me be God and to let me move? When you seek with all of your heart, this scripture says you find. There are no exceptions. And I imagine there's probably somebody saying, well, I, I've done that and it didn't work. No. Nope. You seek with all of your heart, you find. That's just the way that it is. And so God doesn't just automatically control. He's got a plan for your life and it's thoughts of good, of peace. But you have to cooperate. You have to seek. And if you don't, then you can limit God. You know, let me make a statement here that may shock some of you. But God is limited to what you think He is. Not because God in Himself is limited. He's not. God is limitless. God is who He is regardless of who you think He is. But you know what? The nature of God, you find when Jesus came to the earth, He said, I'm meek. And I'm lowly. He had to be invited. Even when his disciples were drowning in the 14th chapter of the book of Matthew, he came walking on the water. And you know the reason he was walking on the water was to go out there and save his disciples. But he made as though he would have walked by them. He went out and showed himself to these disciples that were in the midst of the Sea of Galilee drowning. But he didn't just go running out there and say, Hold on, I'm coming. And he didn't save them. He showed himself and they had to cry out and ask him for help. When he was walking after his resurrection to the road to Emmaus, he was with two disciples and it says he would have gone further, but they compelled him to come in. The Lord isn't going to say, can I come stay with you? He waits on you to invite him in. The Lord, that's just the way that he is. He doesn't force himself. You've got the right to go to hell. And He will defend your right. Nobody can force you to choose God. And so you have to invite Him in. You have to open up the door. And this scripture 
is talking about the fact that God doesn't just sovereignly control your life. He's got a plan for you, but you've got to seek before you find. And you've got to seek with all of your heart. And if you don't do that, you limit Him. So, because of all of that being true, the Lord is to you the way you believe He is. When I was a Baptist and believed that God passed away with the apostles and that miracles didn't happen anymore, and that you couldn't be healed, and, and the Holy Spirit, we thought that all of that stuff had ceased, and that you didn't speak in tongues. Did you know what? When That's the way that I thought God was. He didn't force it on me. He dealt with me where I was. He loved me, and accepted me, and I had a relationship with God, based on... Well, it was certainly wasn't spirit-filled the way that it is. I didn't pray in tongues, and yet he didn't criticize me over that. He met me where I was. He fellowshiped with me based on the way that I thought he was. When I thought, when, when my dad died, I was told that God is the one that took him, that God needed him in heaven more than I did. You know what? That's not true. But that's what I was taught. That's what I believed in. Did you know what? That's the way that I related to God, and that's the way that God was in my life. When I didn't believe that God did miracles, guess what? I never got any. When I didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, guess what? I never spoke in tongues. When I didn't believe in those things, God just met me on the level I was. And you can see this in the ministry of Jesus. He would come to some people and say, according to your faith, be it done unto you. Other people, he'd come and he'd have to do things. Go spit on the ground and make clay and put it on their eyes and get them to do something. And he would meet people according to where they were. You know what? If you believe that God wants you to get up and go to a job that you dislike and suffer through the day and come home and sit down and watch television all evening and then go to sleep and get up and go to a job that you don't like and you just do this over and over. And if you think that this is what life is all about, God will meet you right there. And you'll be saved and stuck. And you know what? You can hold on and you can still go to heaven. Somebody says, do you believe you have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues and operate in miracles and walk in victory to go to heaven? No. <laughs> Matter of fact, you can get there quicker if you don't believe in all these things because you aren't going to be able to walk in health and you're going to die along the way and you can still go to heaven. But why? Why would you want to do it that way? God is to you the way that you believe He is. And if you believe that it's hard for you to live a victorious life, then you know what? God will just meet you there and He'll get you saved and give you an assurance of salvation and you can struggle through. And when you die, you go to heaven and find out all that you could have been experiencing. But you can believe God for big things. You can take the limits off of God. You can limit God by your thinking is what this verse is saying. And brothers and sisters, I believe that this is what the vast majority of us are doing. Most of us are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. We are so afraid. You know, I had a guy come up for prayer one time. And he says, oh, I got this terrible pain in my neck. He says, would you please pray for me? And he says, I've also got pain down my back. My shoulders hurt. He says, I've got a sciatic nerve that goes down my leg and into my foot. And he, he just named off five or six things, and I was just listening to him. He says, but you know what? It's the neck that's really bad. If you could just pray over the neck, I could live with the rest of it. <laughs> and I looked at this guy, and I said, well, I understand what you're saying. If we were to ask God to take care of all of those things at one time, the lights in heaven might dim. I'm not sure that God has enough power to pull off four or five healings all at one time. <laughs> and this guy... He just looked at me and he says, that was really dumb, wasn't it? And I said, that was, that was real dumb. I said, you know what? God can heal all of those things all at one time. But this is the way I had two or three people out there tonight say that they had a bunch of things wrong. But this is the one thing that I really need. Like, we have to prioritize God. Just You can't ask him for multiple things all at one time. He can't multitask. It just... <laughs>
to make it easy for God. You know what? You got, you're limiting God with that kind of thinking. You need to recognize that, man, God is awesome. Most of us are living so far below our privileges. You know, if you were to take the average Christian, and again, I compliment you. I know that many of you come from other countries. You come from other states. I'm not ragging on anybody. I'm glad you're here. But if you took the average Christian in this room and put you side by side with your unsaved neighbor or a person who's not born again who works with you, you know what? In many cases, you wouldn't be able to tell who the Christian is. There are many of you that get sick every time the cold season comes around, every time the flu season comes around, just like the people that don't know God. There are many of you, and again, I'm not saying this to rag on anybody, but there are some of you that have been depressed and discouraged over the economy because you've been plugged into the world and listening to what the world has to say instead of standing on the Word of God, instead of rejoicing. The Bible says when you see all of these things begin to come to pass, shout, rejoice, lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. If you were plugged into the Word of God and not plugged into the fear of this world, you would be rejoicing and praising God because, man, this thing is winding down to a close. This is our best hour. You could be rejoicing. And yet I can guarantee you there's some people sitting right in this room that you have fallen apart like a $2 suitcase, just like all of your unsaved neighbors and friends at work. I'm not saying that to hurt anybody. I'm saying it to enlighten our eyes. There ought to be a difference between us and a person who doesn't know God. We're alive and they're dead. You ought to be able to tell the difference between a live and a dead person. You ought to stand out like a heel thumb. This friend of mine, Dave Duell, says he was at a church holding a meeting and a guy died and they called 911 and they came in and carried out half the auditorium before they found the dead person. There ought to be a difference. You know, if the things we were singing here tonight are true, that man, he conquered death, well then you ought to be, there ought to be a difference in you if you face death. You can see a person raised from the dead, and if they don't raise from the dead, well then you know where they've gone, and you've got, you don't have to weep as other people who have no hope. There ought to be a difference between born again people and people who aren't born again. I'm saying all of these things, brothers and sisters, that, you know, we just have, we've embraced mediocrity. We've embraced living below the standard. Most of us look around and, oh yeah, we know that Jesus said that you can heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. The works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father, John 14, 12. We know those scriptures, but that's not for most of us. Most of us aren't living there. Most of us aren't even moving that direction. I'm not saying this to condemn anybody, but I'm saying until you get stirred up and desire something different, you aren't going to get anything different. This isn't going to happen by fate. It's not going to happen sovereignly where God just makes you become something. God gave you a free will and God respects your free will. God is not going to force you to do anything. You have to stir yourself up or you'll sink to the bottom. Amen? Amen. Look over in Deuteronomy chapter 7 at this verse. This is the, it's the same context. This is Moses speaking right before his death. He's getting ready to go up on the Mount Nebo and he's giving last minute instructions to the Israelites, and he's doing exactly what David did here in Psalms chapter 78. He's rebuking the people and saying, how many times have you turned against God and kept God's will from coming to pass? The Lord never willed for the children of Israel to spend 40 years in the wilderness. He willed for them to come out. He had a period of time at Mount Sinai where he gave them the covenants and established the kingdom, but within one year they should have entered into the promised land. But the people sent out spies in the 13th chapter of the book of Numbers, and they became overwhelmed with fear looking at the size of the giants. And because of that, they limited God. They disbelieved God, and they stopped what God wanted them to do. And so uh, Moses 
is remembering all of this and the Lord is speaking through Moses and he's giving them instructions about this next time they go in and try and conquer the land. And he's telling them um, all of these promises about how that the Lord will drive out all of the uh, people in the land because of this. Let's see, it's verse 17. Well, let me back up and read verse 16. It says, And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God will deliver thee. Thine eyes shall have no pity upon them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for that will be a snare unto thee. If thou shalt say in thine heart, These nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? You know, for a long time I read that as being, If you say in your heart, These nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? You were the one saying all of that. But if you interpret it that way, well, then there's no answer to this. Did you get what I'm saying? Some of you did. Here's what's happening. It says, if you will say in your heart, these nations are more than I, then God is saying, how can I dispossess them? If you doubt, if you say, God, this task is too big. God, I can't do this. Well, then God can't do it through you. It's according to the power that works in you. Psalms, I mean, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Most people will just stop right there and say, he's, ex- he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, period. Matter of fact, I've gone into hundreds of churches and I said, how many of you believe that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think? And I remember one time the pastor on the front row stood up and goes, yes, brother, amen. And I said, that's not true. And he just looked at me and I said, I turn over here and read it. It says he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. The word according to means to the proportion of or to the degree of the power that works in us. If you don't have any power, any faith stirred up on the inside of you, if you aren't believing God for anything, then God cannot do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think. God has to flow through somebody. God always uses a person. And see, again, this goes against this whole teaching of the sovereignty of God, that God just sovereignly moves. There is no such thing as God moving independent of people. God moves through people. God always has to have a man or a woman. There has to be some person that God speaks through. Thank you for the hallelujah and the amen. (laughs) rest of you are thinking this over, but I'm telling you, that's what the Bible says. God raised up Moses. You know why? Because there had to be a person in a physical body that God was flowing through. I could unplug right here and teach for a week on the authority of the believer. God gave authority over this earth to physical human beings. And when God did that, that limited what God could do because God himself is a spirit. John 4, 24 says God is a spirit. And God gave control over this physical earth to people with physical bodies. That is the reason why Jesus had to become a man. You know, I used to ask this question all of the time. God, why did you have to send Jesus? You're God. You could have done anything. Why did you have to send your son and have him crucified and go through all of this? And of course, that's a big question with a big answer. But the, the short version of it is because God was a spirit and he gave control over this earth to physical human beings. God had to become a man because all of us men were corrupted. We couldn't redeem ourselves, And so God had to become a man to come down here and deal with the devil. He had to become a physical human being. And Jesus allowed God to flow through him in a way that put Satan in his place. Now Satan is a defanged foe. He can't do anything except gum you to death. All he does is lie to us and intimidate us. And Satan can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. And the problem is we've been consenting and cooperating more than we should. 
And it's through intimidation and things like this. One of the things, the very first thing that I'm trying to do here tonight is before you can start believing bigger and taking the limits off of God, you've got to recognize that you have a say in this. That God isn't going to just flow through you without your consent. You have to seek to find. And you have to seek with all of your heart. And if you don't, you limit God. If you say in your heart, these nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? God cannot kick them people out unless He has a person to flow through. God always has a person to flow through. Amen. And again, I say that the eyes of the Lord are here tonight. And He's looking and saying, is there anybody who will say, God, I want to be used. God, I want to reach my full potential. God, I want to be more than what I am. I don't want to be natural. I want to be supernatural. I want to walk in the power of God. I want to, man, I want it to be that when I die, somebody misses me. If you aren't living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. You need, to be, you need to be believing for something, making your life count for something. Every one of you have an influence. You know, I'm spending millions of dollars every month to be on television and do the things that I'm doing. And yet I can guarantee you, every person in here has a realm of influence, people that know you and are watching you that will never hear of me, that I'll never reach. I don't care if I was spending $10 million a month. I'll not reach people that are watching you. Every one of you is touching somebody that I can't touch. Every one of you have a realm of influence. And you know what? It's not just a matter of what's convenient for you and what's easy for you and whether or not this is going to interfere with your TV viewing schedule or not. You need to recognize that somebody's watching you and there's somebody that is under your realm of influence, that if you don't reach God's potential, if you don't do what God's called you to do, there's somebody that's going to go without the witness, without seeing the power of God in your life. Every one of you. Every one of you. There's not a person in here who's not a leader. You know how I define a leader? Somebody's got somebody following you. And you know what? Every one of you has got somebody looking at you and following you. If nothing else, they're looking at you and they're discouraged because of it. <laughs> and they're following that. And it's just allowing them to fall right into it. And they're looking around and saying, well, nobody's doing anything. We need some people to stand up and start showing that, praise God, you can go against the flow. You can swim upstream. You can be different. That we can do the things that Jesus said we can do. And you've got to recognize that it doesn't happen without your participation. You, in a sense, occasion it. I am not, here's what I'm not saying. I am not saying that you can manipulate God and make God do anything. You can't make God do anything. God is God and you aren't. But God has a plan for you that He's not going to cram down your throat. And until you stir yourself up and until you start pushing and pers persevering and saying, God, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I want to do something significant. I want to make my life count. I want to have the abundant life that you promised me. Until you start moving in that direction, God cannot bring His perfect will to pass in your life. So in a sense, you occasion it. God's already got it planned out for you, but you have to choose to participate. You have to pursue it. It doesn't happen without your consent and cooperation. And so this is one of the very first things that the Lord spoke to me. He told me, Andrew, I've got a plan for your life that is bigger than what you've embraced. And it wasn't that I was rebellious towards it. I had embraced it. But you know, back in the beginning of my ministry when... Like I told you, when I started, people stayed away from the meetings by the droves. And it just wasn't appropriate. It wasn't time. I went through 30-something years, 34 years of growing and doing some things. 
And it just wasn't time. And so I had to put that vision to the side because it wasn't time yet. I hadn't grown. I hadn't matured to a place where I could do it. And so it wasn't time. But I had become complacent. I'd gotten used to just everything being off in the future. I'm not saying that I wasn't seeking God and I wasn't trying to cooperate. It wasn't willing, but nonetheless, there was a complacency in my heart. And boy, January the 31st, 2002, God rang my bell. And God told me, you're limiting me. And I tell you, it made a difference. And I began to immediately confess, I am going to do what God told, told, told me to do. And I'm going to confess it and tell anybody. I don't care who hears it. And if you don't like it, it's your problem. It's not mine. And I started speaking. And I tell you, the transformation is absolutely amazing. You know, I meant to do this at the beginning of this message and I forgot it, but... Let me, I've got, uh, I went back and picked four areas that have changed since January of 2002 till uh, January of 2009. And we've got some graphs on that. I don't know what order you've got those in. Who's doing this, Carol? Which one you got first? All right, here's, here's the total number of people. This will show you in 2001, that's the year prior to when the Lord spoke to me, January 31st. We were averaging 5,500 contacts per month. In 2008, we were averaging right at 32,000 contacts per month. And that is just because I made a difference in the way I was looking at things. What's the next one? Phone calls. This shows we were averaging around 2,000 calls a month. We are now up to 19,000 calls a month. We've actually had 22,000 calls is one of the highest... Uh, volumes that we've had in one month's time. The number of new people contact in the ministry, 961 per month in 2001, up to 4,300 per month. And of course, that's not that's an average for 2008. We've hit, I forgot what it was, 7,000 or something back in November. And so anyway, it's going up. And then this is our revenue. We were getting less than $210,000 or around $210,000 a month in 2001 and now it takes around 1.2 million is the average for 2008 and actually we've now gotten to a place uh, that we have to have 1.3 and that's excluding our Bible college. Our Bible college figures aren't included in there so we're right now probably close to one and a half million that we have to have. And my only purpose for sharing this, it's not for any other reason except to just give you a physical proof that what I'm saying is true. I had been ministering. You know, I see Jerry and Judy White, and there's so many people here that I've known in the Phoenix area for since 1980. I've been coming here nearly 30 years, and they've seen me. And, and man, I have ministered with everything I've got and been coming here. And yet, since 2002, it's like a bomb went off. The ministry...